So now we want to take the quartiles that we've just learned about and create a couple more definitions. The first thing we want to talk about is the interquartile range, which I will almost always refer to as the IQR. IQ, interquartile, R stands for range. It's the range of the middle 50% of the observations of a data set. So in other words, it's all the values from Q1 to Q3. And it's a measure of the variability, i.e. the dispersion, i.e. the spread, right, dispersion or spread of your data set. I warned you there was going to be one more measure of spread, and now it's here. We've learned range, we learned standard deviation, we learned variance, and now we're learning IQR. Now the formula for IQR is very easy. It's just Q3 minus Q1. That's all there is to it. <laughs> it's simple as that. Now what is it? Well, if you look at it on a box plot, it's actually the distance, oop, sorry. It's actually this distance from here to here. That's IQR. It's the spread. It's the spread of the box in a box plot. literally the width of that box, right, if you want to think of the spread. So width of the box in the box plot, which is what that graph is called. I should have told you that before. <laughs> Sorry about that. So it's called the box plot. Okay, so um, Q3 minus Q1 is the width of the box part in a box plot, what I just said. So there you go. Now, what's advantageous about the IQR is that like the median, it's resistant to outliers, which if you remember, the standard deviation is not, right? So IQR is resistant, standard deviation and variance are not. Standard deviation and variance and range, actually, are all susceptible, they're all sensitive, are all sensitive to outliers. If you have an outlier, they really get affected, right? But the IQR is great because it resists that. That's why I said on the previous page that when I give out my exam scores, I often give the five number summary because in so doing, I'm giving the IQR. IQR is the distance from this value to this value. So in this case, IQR would have been 94 take away 69. Sorry, 94 take away 69, which would have been 25. Okay, so that's how it works. Oh, that's a nine right there. Sorry, my arrow from the previous thing makes it look weird. Just so you can see how easy this is to calculate. Okay, so let's calculate it from our values. And again, because it's calculated from the quartiles, just keep in mind, if you're using a TI calculator, it will be slightly different answers than StatCrunch. Um, I think most instructors are using StatCrunch, but if you use a TI, just make sure you note it to your instructor that you're using a TI. Okay, so we already found these values. Um, Q3 and Q1 were already given to us. We found them on the previous page, but also StatCrunch finds these. So let's use stat. Let me write down the stat crunch path. It's the same path we keep using. Stat, summary stat, columns. And we can actually get all of these values if we play our cards right. Okay, so let me go to that data set. I'm going to close this. Stat, summary stat, columns, click. I click on exam three scores. Oh, let me unzoom this so you can kind of see. There. Here, let me redo this. Because <laughs> it, it makes the, the box as um, big or as small as my window is. So stat, summary, stat, columns, exam three. I want them, um, oh, let's start with the, the range. I'll put them in the same order that they put them in the sheet. Range is in here somewhere. There it is, range. Next, I want the IQR. There it is. Control click. Or if you're on a Mac, command click. Mean is up to the top. There's mean. Median is right there. There's median. Standard deviation. This was a sample. So I'm going to pick this one. And there's the variance, right? Because these are sample values. 
and I say compute and there they are. I'm going to zoom in again so you can see those better. They're hard to see. And then we just write them all down. 39, 11, the mean is 80 point, um, let's think, they probably want one decimal place, so I'll do 80.9, the median is 84, the standard deviation is 10.6, and the variance is 112.3, that's the variance. I was just writing them all down on my sheet. There they are. Now these are probably, um, they need units, so it's probably points, so you could put points on all of them. You know, sometimes it's inches, sometimes it's dollars. This one's points. And of course, the last one's points squared, which is pointless. Get it? Pointless. But it's, you know, what are you going to do? All right, next, they would like us to describe the shape or describe this distribution. OK, so that terminology is used by the author of the textbook. And what they want is the shape, the center, and the spread. Okay, so shape. Well, for shape, we basically have always had three options, skewed left, skewed right, or symmetric. If I look at my mean and my median, this is skewed left, right? The 80.9 is significantly less than the 84, so this is skewed left. Because the mean, which is 80.9, is less than, right, the pointy end faces it, the median, right, the monster eats the larger thing, which is 84. In my, my school, it was always alligators. I don't know why. <laughs> I didn't live in Florida. I lived in Michigan, but that, nevertheless, that's what my teacher taught me. All right, so mean is smaller, right, the mean is smaller. When the mean, the mean is the one that gets pulled to the tail. So the mean is smaller because, um, which makes it skewed left, which means there's a left tail. Now the center. Okay, well, if it's skewed left, we learned way back in section 3.1 that when it's skewed left, when your data is skewed, or skewed, I should say, you want to use the median. The median is the better measure because it resists that tail. We have a tail going off here to the left, right? This is um, from section 3.1. So we want the median. So that's what we're going to say. The median is 84 points. So because for skewed data, the median is the better measure of center. We learned that back in section 3.1. And measure of center just means average, right? Where's the middle? All right, now what about the spread? Okay, well, the thing is that we've learned four measures for spread so far. We learned the range, the standard deviation, the variance, and the IQR. So of course we're gonna use the IQR. The IQR is 11 points. Why? Well, because of what I wrote up here. For skewed data, the IQR is the better measure of spread. Right, because it resists outliers. All right, so again, because skewed data, the IQR is the better measure of spread. And I'll actually summarize all of this about better measures of center and spread and all of that in the very last, or I shouldn't say that, but in a notes page towards the end, probably the very last page of chapter three. So look out for that. So we'll have a video later <laughs> where I'll kind of go through all the shapes one more time and which is the better measure of center and spread and all that. But suffice to say that because it's resistant, it's the better measure of spread for skewed data, right? Not all data are skewed, but if they're skewed, the IQR is better. All right, now, one other thing we want to touch on is the official, official way to find outliers. So outliers are, are we've kind of visually seen them up to this point, like you looked at um, a dot plot and you went, oh, that's an outlier, it's way far out there. Right, so we, we did that. Matter of fact, if you remember, 
we had that tarantula example. And I mentioned at the time, like, hey, here's all the pets for all the students, and there's the person with the tarantula. That's an outlier, right? And, you know, it is, but how could we prove it? And we haven't actually proven something as an outlier until now. This is how to actually prove, rather than just looking at the graph and thinking it's an outlier, this is how to prove it's an outlier, right? So this is a method to prove a point is an outlier, a data point is an outlier, rather than just a visual inspection of a graph or something like that. This is going to prove that it's an outlier. This is the official method. All right, so it it's, looks more involved than it is, <laughs> but Q1 and three, Q3, you find them. Okay, so, you know, I can do that. Step one, Q1 was... Um, we already did this a page ago. I had it for this data set. It was uh, 77. Q3 was 88, right? Because we've already found those values for the data set, right? Because we're just continuing with this exam data set that I had. And then step two, um, I'm just going to fit it in over here. So here's step one, here's step two. IQR, which we already found above, it's Q3 minus Q1, which is 88 minus 77, which is 11. Now, I know we already found that up above, but for your own benefit, write it down because you never know if you're not going to be given the data set. If I just gave you Q3 and Q1 and asked you what IQR is, you should be able to know how to find it. So make sure you write down these notes for yourself for later. You won't always be given the raw data set. All right. Number three, I moved my camera just to touch so I could write at the bottom of this page. All right, so number three, step three, find the fences. And th these are formulas. These can go on your note sheet, right? The lower fence and the upper fence. You don't have to memorize them. They can be put on the note sheet for your exam. So the lower fence, I'm just going to abbreviate LF for lower fence. It's Q1 minus 1.5. That's multiplication right, times IQR, which would be 77, take away 1.5 times the IQR, which was 11. I'll find that in a second, but I'm going to go write the other one. The other one is Q3 plus 1.5 IQR, which is 88, because that's Q3, plus 1.5 times 11. All right, so let's go find those values. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what they must mean. All right, so 77 take away 1.5 times 11. Type it just like that. A lot of students get these wrong because they're typing them incorrectly into usually their phone calculator. Phone calculators are not good for something like this because you need to have the order of operations correct. So you're better off with Desmos than you are with your phone. Um, for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that um, phones don't show the order of operations, and Desmos does. All right, so there are our values. This is the lower fence, this is the upper fence. Technically, all of these have points as their unit. That's the unit. Um, even this one, points, points, points. I don't write units all the time for these, but that's what they would be, right? And it it's just what it is for this problem, right? If you were doing a problem with money, it would be dollars or whatever, you know, it is what it is, or inches or meters or things like that. All right, so now any value that is in the data set that is lower than this value or higher than this value would be an outlier. That's what it's saying. Any values that are outside the fences are outliers. So what are you learning when you learn these values? These two values are the boundaries for um, the regular points for the regular zone. Any number between those two values is normal. It's what we expect. That's a regular value. Any point that's outside those fences is an outlier. Right? If you're outside the, um, these fences, you are in outlier zone. Okay, so let's look at our data points. So if we look back, we actually have three values that are below the lower fence. 
54, 56, and 60 are all below the or lower fence. So 54, 56, and 60 are all outliers. because they're below the lower fence. We didn't have any upper outliers. An upper outlier would have been somebody that scored like 107. Right? If you scored 107, that would have been a high outlier. But we didn't have any of those because we didn't have any scores even close to 100. So that didn't, that didn't work for us. But we did have some low outliers. right? That's the official, official way to figure out whether something's an outlier or not.